I sometimes feel like we need to put together, like what the movies do, a six-minute credit um, at the end of the services. Not that anybody would stick around to look at all those, but uh, there's just so many people that are involved in the things that go on, and from the worship team to the baptism team to our custodial team, uh, the sound and light crew back here, and just want to thank all of them uh, for all the work that they do uh, namelessly each week in helping us to, to worship and to set up an environment where where God is, is welcomed here and uh, leading us into his, his throne. So thank you all for everything that you do for us in that, that regard. So we are still in the book of Mark. Be here for a while. Uh, Mark chapter 1. The previous couple weeks, if you haven't been here, and if you have, just kind of give you an overview real quickly of Mark. The Instagram of the Gospels really quickly getting the fact and really setting the stage. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and uh, defining for us who that is. He's presented the witnesses legally of saying there were enough witnesses to proclaim who he was that in a court of law it would stand up as far as evidence go that he is God. Jesus then proclaiming that uh, now by his authority last week, showing that he had authority and has authority over demons. Jesus is more powerful, has authority. The demons, the spiritual world, the spiritual forces bow to his authority. The demons tremble at his presence, and he shows, I am God because I have this authority. Today we're going to see that again as Jesus continues to declare his being God, not so much in words as much as by his declaration now, in authority over uh, illnesses. It's Mark chapter 1. If you look real quickly, verse 29, I'm going to, to take a couple of things, a couple of different stories that happen here in Mark chapter 1. The first one happens immediately after what we, took, what we saw last week of Jesus being in the synagogue. And it says as much, so Mark chapter 1, verse 29, says, And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew, with James and John. Remember, Jesus has moved his base of operations from Nazareth to Capernaum. This is where Simon and Andrew were from. Um, so he enters the, the house of Simon and Andrew. It says, Now Simon's mother in law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. He came, Jesus came, and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Jump forward with me to verse 40. And so, you know, in that same area, same time, uh, just a few, probably a few moments or a few days later, and says, And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out, the leper, but the leper went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. So a couple instances where Jesus begins, uh, shows us, Mark shows us through the life of Jesus, Jesus' authority over illnesses, Jesus' authority over our issues. Just real quickly, uh, just a real quick verse by verse, we're going to see that there's several types of people that come out in these stories. First of all, you have the people with need. Here is uh, Jesus comes into the house of Simon Andrew. Uh, Simon Andrew tells Jesus, hey, my mother-in-law is sick. Can you come attend her? And so he goes in and he heals her. There are those people around us with need. The leper uh, comes and sees Jesus and, and realizes that Jesus has authority. Jesus is able to help him with his condition, with his issue. And he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, if you would, if it were your will, you have the ability to help me. And Jesus said, I will be clean. So in the first instance, you have people interceding for the one with need. 
And it's their faith. They're saying Jesus is able to attend in this situation. Jesus, let us alert you to the fact that this is going on. The second one, the leper himself, realizing in his own faith, Jesus has the ability to help me. I need to go ask him if he would. There are those with needs. Now, we all have issues. My wife would tell you very clearly, my husband has issues. We all have, have these, these, these things. But it's what we do with the issues that begins to matter. Some of these issues can be physical in nature. We see these two stories here where the people were sick. They uh, were ill. Uh, in one case, the sickness kept the leper outcast from society. According to the law, Levitical law in chapter 13, the lepers were considered unclean. They were to be removed from the community. And so abiding in the law, the leper was in a community by himself or outside of the, of the normal society. Uh, Simon's mother-in-law was feeling so poorly, apparently, that she couldn't get up. She could not do what she normally would do in serving folks. And so their needs kept them away from society, kept them from their daily normal function. These were, were physical in nature. Sometimes our issues are other than that. We may have issues that are, are financial. We may have issues that are uh, mental. We may have issues that, that we create at work. Where it is, one point or another, you're going to have an issue. It's just a fact of life. Life is about issues. And so what do we do about that? Well, we realize, one, there are these people with issues. We are people around us with issues. One of my uh, recent favorite movies or movies I enjoy watching is The Legend of Bagger Vance. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a golfing movie um, about the turn of the, the century. Um, but um, at one point in the movie, uh, Randolph Juna is out in the woods. He has hit his ball way off of the fairway. And he's several strokes behind the two really good professional golfers who have already named names for themselves, Bobby Jones and, and Walter Hagen. And he's just um, really in the, in the slumps. He's carrying with him a baggage of the fact that he's been to war, he's been back, and just all the baggage that comes with, you call it PTSD, you call it my life that just went screw, whatever, a bunch of different things. But he's now having to deal with this, and this uh, uncommon caddy is helping him through this. Well, at this point, Juno is trying to figure out how to get his ball out of the woods back to the fairway. And he tells Bagger, he says, I, I, I don't know what to do with this. And Bagger, not talking about the ball, talking about him, he says this. He says, ain't a soul on this entire earth ain't got a burden to carry he don't understand. You ain't alone in that. But you've been carrying this one long enough. Time to go on. Lay it down. Juna says, I don't know how. Bagger Vance says, you got a choice. You can stop or you can start. Juna says, start. Vance says, walking. Juna, where? Vance, right back to where you always been. And then stand there still, real still, and remember. And Juna says, it's too long ago. Vance says, oh, no, sir. It was just a moment ago. Time for you to come on out of the shadows, Juna. Time for you to choose. Juna says, I can't. Bagger Vance says, yes, you can, but you ain't alone. I'm right here with you. I've been here all along. Now play the game, your game, the one that only you was meant to play, the one that was given to you when you come into this world. You ready? Strike that ball, Judah. Don't hold nothing back till it give it everything. Now is the time. Let yourself remember. Remember your swing. That's right, Judah. Settle yourself. Let's go. Now is the time, Judah. The only thing missing in all this dialogue is the name of Jesus. Because if y'all remember about a month ago, there come a time when Mary was looking for Jesus and they run back to the temple and to find him there and Jesus looks at them and says, why have you been looking for me? Didn't you know that I'd be in my father's house? And as Lauren L. Harris would go on to sing, didn't you know I had plans the world knew nothing about? When every road you're traveling only leads you to an end. I'll still be here, right where I've always been. Y'all, we've got issues. But you want those solved? It starts with Jesus. And he is right there, right where he has always been, right beside you, 
waiting for you to admit the fact that you need him. That you can't do this by yourself. That he really to admit the fact that he has authority over your issues. That he can if you'll let him. Because he's right there, right where he's always been. There's another type of person here, those who brought the sick to, to Jesus. And you see Simon and Andrew taking Jesus to Simon's mother-in-law saying, Hey, Jesus, we have a friend, we have a relative who here who has an issue. And they bring Jesus to this person. And next week, if you look to Mark 2, one of the passages you guys well know are the four friends who bring their friend and, and make a hole in the roof and lower their friend to Jesus. There are those who aren't... Uh, complacent who, who aren't comfortable just to sit on the sidelines and they see those with issues around them and they say, you know, we don't have an issue, but they do. But we know someone who can take care of that. I don't know what to do about your issue, but I know someone who does. Let me bring you to him. Let me show you Jesus. Let me bring you to him so that you can experience him, so you can find out who he is and what he can do for your life. This is a second type of a person who they don't need anything, um, their, their issue has probably at one time been solved, or they know that Jesus is helping them with their issue. It's not keeping them from them being externally focused and, and saying, you know, your issue, Jesus can take that. My issue, ah, Jesus got that. Let me help you with yours. You begin to realize if you're this type of person that, yes, you're going to continue to have issues, but God's got that. And your issues kind of begin to diminish because you see others' issues. And not that you judge others greater than your own, but you see people who have issues and they don't have Jesus. You've got the answer. They don't. And so Jesus, your answer is taking care of your issue. But they are, are a, a, a person out there in the water without a life vest or without something. And you have the, the life preserver to toss their way. You have the answer for them. They are living in darkness and they're going to die in darkness unless someone takes it to them. Simon and Peter were these. They, they interceded for their mother-in-law. Sometimes that's the best we can do is, is, is just pray. And that's where it all starts really anyway, is interceding for those with issues around us. Oftentimes God then, through our prayer, moves us into action to do much more than that. But it starts, it starts there. But here, if you notice, there are these, those that are just kind of watching. It says here in verse 33, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Now, the whole city is there. And it says he's healed many who are sick with various diseases. But there are, are people here who are just gazing. They're just gawking. They're just kind of standing by the sidelines. These are the uh, groupies, if you would. Hey, let's see what's going on. Let's follow the ambulance and see what's, what's happening. Let's stand across the street because we like the lights. We like the sound. We like to see, you know, I haven't tweeted in quite a while. I need some new material to tweet out to my friends. What else is going on? What's the latest gossip? I'm not here to help. I'm just here to spectate. I'm here to, to get my thrills of just watching what's going on. You always have those who are content to sit on the sidelines and watch the game. They're, they don't consider themselves athletes. They don't consider themselves part of the game. They, don't think, they may not think they're worthy enough to get in the game. For whatever reason, they decide not to participate, but they're going to be there, and they're going to follow the action wherever it goes. And you see this happening through Jesus' life where that's why he had 5,000 men to feed because, you know, these groupies following him around everywhere. But at the end of the day, where are they? You know, it was the same people who celebrated Jesus coming into Jerusalem that just a few days later cried, crucify him. The exact same crowd. And so you've got people with issues. You've got people who are willing to help the people with issues and go out of their way to see how can I help you understand and know Jesus and maybe I need to be Jesus to you and help you through this. But then you're always going to have those who just kind of sit around stand around, who are just there to gawk and to gaze. But there's a couple other types here as well. There's the grateful servant. Notice what Simon's mother-in-law does after Jesus 
solves her issue. Verse 31, it says, He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her. And what did she do? She just kind of laid there and says, I'm going to wait for the next issue because this is kind of fun. I like being waited on. No. She got up and began to serve. Her issue had been dealt with. There was no excuse now for her not to get up into her normal function and get back to work. Her issue had been dealt with. And so she was a grateful servant. She said, God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing my issue. Now I'm getting back in the game. I'm getting back in the fight. I'm not going to stand here. I'm not going to wait until the next time. I'm not going to be a dependent. I'm going to get back into this fight. I'm going to do what I have to do. The leper. And although the leper didn't do what Jesus asked him to do, he still got in the fight. He got and did it. And it wasn't so much that, you know, if you go back and want to watch, the, if you weren't able to catch it, I touched on the basis of the messianic secret and all that entails of Jesus telling the leper not to go. So you watch the Facebook Live. I'm not going to get into that. But the fact is, is that he got up and went going. He said, Jesus came and touched someone who was untouchable. He touched me. The leper was, was not able to receive human contact. Jesus reaches out, touches him, and he immediately goes and starts telling people, hey, look what has happened in my life. These two people did not just sit on the sidelines. They did not just say, especially the leper had every excuse to say, well, you know, I've been out of work now for so many years. I don't know what to do. I think I'll just kind of stand on the street corner. That seemed to kind of work real well and have people continue to bring me food and all that kind of stuff. And I'll just wait here until the next issue comes along. And, and you don't see him doing that. Now I realize that some people who are out there on the corners have got issues that they can't somehow get over. And I'm not going to get into all of those. I'm not going to judge them. But there are some of people that God solves their issue and they go out looking for the next issue. And the Bible over and over again tells us that's not how this thing works. We don't step back to be blessed so that God can continue blessing us. He blesses us so that we can be a blessing. He gives us grace so that we can extend that grace to others. But there are those who like to stay victims whether it's because they draw attention or it's just easier to live off the system, there are those who are just content to receive. Now, I'm just going to hang around and just continue to be the one with the issue because I seem to have gotten attention that way. So I ask you this morning, which one are you? Where do you fit in? And maybe a combination of some of these. Real quick, let me give you several steps in dealing with your issues and give you some biblical verses to help with this. And so if you've got a pen and paper, we're going to throw these all up on the screen at once and you can, you can write them down. But steps in dealing with your issues. First of all, realize that God gave us his word to equip us, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That the word of God, the, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for correction and reproof and instruction and training in righteousness so that we might be fully equipped for the work that God has prepared for us to do. Realize also that we have his spirit to encourage us and guide us and lead us into all truth, as John 14 would say. But let me give you some, some, some tangible steps that when you have an issue, regardless of whether it's physical, mental, financial, spiritual, whatever that issue may be, here are some things, that you, a checklist, if you would, to kind of get you on the right track. And it's not exhaustive, but again, to get you started. Again, remember that it all begins and ends with Jesus. How is your relationship with the Savior? Are you praying regularly? Are you reading his word on a regular basis? Are you worshiping on a regular basis? John 15, 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It all begins and ends with Jesus. Also realize that you are made in the image of God. Psalm 139, some of the, my favorite verses in this psalm are, um, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. You are made in the image of God. You have value. You have tremendous value. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. If your issue is a depression, if your issue is... Um, just, just don't think that you can get by another day. You have the ultimate worth, and the identity is found in Jesus, and your value is found in him, not what other people think of you. You were made in the image of God. 
Pursue holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 tells us that we ought to be about on a daily basis pursuing holiness, integrity, living a life in righteousness through Christ Jesus. And so if your issue is a result of things in your life, be it vices, be it addictions, be it something else that has got you down, then you need to stop. Pursue holiness. Pursue integrity. If your issue is an ethical problem at work on the part of somebody else and you're tempted to deceive in order to get by, pursue holiness. Let God be God in your situation. Realize that God is bigger than your colleagues at work. God is bigger than your bosses who might be unethical or immoral. God is bigger than your problems. You stay with a person of integrity and righteousness and allow God to work out that everything else in your life. Breathe. Sometimes we forget. Take a step back. Chill out. God, how am I going to fix my car? I don't have the money to do this. This is a really bad timing. Take a step back. Breathe. Be still and know that he is God. Psalm 146.10. Focus on God's power rather than the size of your issue. And trust in him even though it doesn't make sense. Get plugged into a community of believers. Romans 12.3-6 tells us that God has made us with gifts not for our own sake, but to plug those in and share those with others that we might work in harmony one with another. Plus the fact that in a community of believers, you have people who are praying for you, you have people encouraging you, you have people and you realize sometimes, as I do, is I get in the community and I go, dude, they've got issues. I don't have an issue. (laughs) Find your community of believers that you can be connect with. We've got quite a few here on Sunday mornings that we'd be glad for you to plug into. Be responsible. Prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, you guys know it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It may take a lot of work, but guys, you're not alone. But passivity is not the goal. God calls us to active responsibility. So be obedient. Galatians 6, 4 and 5 speak to this. Get externally focused. The more you concentrate on others' needs, the less you'll see your own. And as you get out and begin to serve others, the less you'll notice of your own. A really good illustration in the Bible is Dorcas, who spent her life serving others and serving others and serving others to the point where she eventually, you know, whether it be old age or whatever the reason is, I don't remember right now, I may not even say. But she died serving others. Her legacy was left in serving others. And Peter comes along and raises her from the dead. But the, the fact is that you know, her life was not on her own issues. It was on others, serving others. Get externally focused. Get out there. Begin to serve. And finally, seek counsel. Proverbs 1.5 is, one, is one place to start in, in Bible saying that there is wisdom among many. There is wisdom in advisors. Proverbs is just tons of verse, one after verse after another, that seeking wisdom, seeking advice from others is wise. There are some issues that require professional help. There are some issues that require a doctor. There are some issues that require taking two Advil. Okay? That's how God wants to solve this issue. So when it comes down to it, seek help. It's not bad to seek counsel. The Bible says wisdom. That's why God gave us intelligence. That's why God has given us schools. That's why God has given us the ability to make medical breakthroughs and for Christian counselors to help us with psychology and these things because the Holy Spirit is a great counselor and these people have training, especially the Christian ones. I wouldn't go to a secular psychologist, but to a Christian counselor who can help you see what is the God's way for me to deal with certain issues in my life. It's okay to do these things, but be proactive. Don't sit back and wait to just receive. Be proactive. 
and Jesus will walk with you. Now, does he always solve your issue the way you want it to be solved? No, no. But Jesus will solve your issue according to his goodness and his faithfulness, according to, in the manner that will glorify him and in a manner that will extend the grace that we have received to others. There's, I have pseudo gout on my left knee, and although it's a minor thing, it's, I've had it for six or seven years. And um, it just won't go away. My body's aside, I'm going to put liquid on your knee, I'm going to keep it there. And so, you, you know, you, you deal with it. You say, Jesus, on a constant basis, I really would like you to remove this. It would help me play Howard a little bit better in racquetball. <laughs> but it's there. He hasn't removed it. But his grace is sufficient for me. And whatever he chooses to do through this in my life, whatever he chooses to do through the arthritis I have inherited from my grandmother, you know, we've all got issues. But Jesus' grace is sufficient for these. He walks with me on a daily basis. And because of his power, I know that his power is greater than my issues, then I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in your presence forever. Father, I pray that you would allow us to be able to look past our issues and see you. Thank you, Jesus, because you have shown us that you have authority over our issues. That you are God. And that you will help us to, to either live through these issues or bear these issues because you are a good God and many times you will solve them for your glory and your name and your fame. So Lord, I pray that you will use the issues in my life so that people might come to know you as Lord and Savior. I pray that you will use the issues in my life so that you would always be glorified and your kingdom extended. And I will give you honor and glory. I will confess when I need to, Lord, because sometimes these issues are my fault. Father, thank you because you forgive and you have always restored me and you will continue to do so. Lord, we give you our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.